Well, hello everyone. It's great to all have you here and welcome to the inaugural Alpha Woman webinar. I'm so excited uh, to have everybody on the line and to have Caitlin Kirk, uh, CPA, joining us today as our expert. Um, my name is Leslie Andrichuk and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Alpha Woman. Um, so as I mentioned today, I'm really excited to have Caitlin with me, um, you know, during this really, really challenging time. Um, I know many of us are struggling with cash flow. Many of us are small business owners. So she's going to help us um, look today at how we can map out our cash flow to reduce costs and help us look at the various government aid programs that are available here in Canada. But before I turn it over to Caitlin, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about Alpha Woman Co. Uh, if you don't know much about Alpha Woman, um, we are a media publishing and events company, and our mission is to help women optimize their lives physically, mentally, professionally, and financially. So we do that through our various platforms, starting with alphawomanco.com, which is our digital publication. We also launched a podcast uh, in January, which is for downloads. I uh, really love the podcast as well. So we, we interview inspirational alpha women uh, on our weekly podcast, and you can find it at podcast.alphawomanco.com or on iTunes or on Spotify. We also, as you know, because you're here today, uh, we have our new webinar series. Uh, so we plan to come out every Tuesday at one o'clock with a new webinar. So make sure you sign up on our website uh, for our newsletter to hear about uh, those events. And before the COVID pandemic, we uh, were doing in real life events. So once this is all settled down, you can certainly look to us to be doing uh, more of these very successful events that we were focusing on. So, um, just a few little housekeeping um, items. Um, as I mentioned before, please go to alphawomanco.com, sign up for our weekly newsletter to get updates on everything Alpha Woman. Follow us on our social channels. Our handle on all of the channels is Alpha Woman Co. And of course, we need to make money. So please, for any sponsorship opportunities, also for any webinar comments or ideas, or we're always looking for great podcast guests. So email myself at leslie at alphawomanco.com or you can reach out through any of our social platforms. Now about Caitlin, uh, again really appreciative that is she is here today and giving us some of her time. So Caitlin is a charter, chartered professional accountant at CPA and she does help and focuses on small business owners. I'll let her um, you know talk a little bit about um, herself a little bit more um, and as I mentioned Today, Caitlin is taking us through her cash flow mapping process, and she's going to update us on the various government profile, um, government programs available. There were some changes that were made yesterday, so um, you know, prepare uh, your questions for her. And also, we have a podcast featuring Caitlin where we go more in depth about her journey as an entrepreneur um, and uh, her life. Uh, so don't miss that dropping April 30th. What you don't know about Caitlin is that she's a volleyball enthusiast and well, it's a little tricky to um, play volleyball and indoors in your home, but she does have a strategy. So listen to the podcast and, and you'll hear more. Now during the, during the webinar, don't hesitate to ask your questions in the chat area and um, we, will, we will ask them dynamically and live as Caitlin goes along. Hi Caitlin. Hello. Hello, thank you for having me. I am going to share my screen with you. Can you all see that? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so right now, uh, because the world is uncertain and that means that our income is uncertain, um, I really believe that cash flow and cash management is more important than ever because our margin for error is a lot smaller right now. Um, and a big part of active cash management is really understanding 
where your money's going and where it's coming from and how those pieces line up. So today I want to take you through three steps. Um, I want to help you to understand your cash. So like I was saying, where it's coming from, where it's going. I want to take you through how to overcome any shortfalls that you have. And then we're going to do a third step, was, which is to create a tool to actually help us manage our cash. So I'm going to go through uh, a spreadsheet demo, and we're going to build a tool live together. So I'm super excited about that. I love Excel. <laughs> so step one, the first thing we need to do is understand what we spend money on. And this is actually harder than it seems. Uh, if a lot of clients, I'll go through this process with them and they'll say, okay, great, let's write down what you spend money on. And they can, they list a good number of things, but there's always some expenses that end up slipping through our brains or we forget about them, or maybe they only happen annually. So we don't remember or whatever it is. So really getting an understanding of what you spend money on. And that means going and getting bank statements or credit card statements or like wherever you're recording or your wherever you're recording transactions or somebody else is recording it for you in the case of a bank statement. Another piece is where does our cash come from? So as small business owners, it's a lot harder to have consistent cash coming in. If we're employed with somebody, they pay us every two weeks or whatever the schedule is. And it's a lot easier to say, okay, I'm going to get this much money. And the whole budgeting process is a lot easier. Um, so as small business owners, we really need to know where the money is coming from and not just what sales we're making, but what cash is coming in because sales, as we know, is different than cash. We can make a sale and not get paid for 30 days. So cash management becomes very important in that, in that scenario. And then once we understand both sides of that, where we spend money and where it comes in, uh, we need to make sure that we don't miss any payments and that's outgoing or incoming. So that means, you know, bills that need to be paid or if somebody hasn't paid us in a long time, we want to make sure that we're following up with them. And I, I'm going to go through some tricks to uh, maximizing our, our cash for sure. Um, do we have any questions so far? Or should I keep, keep going? Yeah, I don't see any questions so far, so keep on. Yep. Okay. Step two is once we have an understanding, we've mapped out our expenses and our income, and I do this weekly. Uh, not that I update this tool weekly, but I like to see it in a weekly um, expenses and income by week. So that's what we're gonna set up later, and I'm gonna show you how all this comes together. But I do that because I think if we do it by month, which is the more traditional way of doing it, then we can sometimes have shortfalls within the month that we don't necessarily see coming. So we could look at say the month of April or the month of May and look at our cash that's coming in and think, okay, I've got $2,000 of cash that I know is coming in. I only have $1,000 in expenses, I'm gonna be okay. But what happens if that cash comes in at the end of the month and you have to make payments before that comes in? So that's where I think the weekly view is really important. Uh, and it allows us to more actively manage our cash and to, to understand where those short, shortfalls are going to be on any given week so that we can do something about it. I think one of the biggest causes of anxiety around cash is not that I won't be able to pay my bills. It's that I'm not sure if I will be able to. And if we know we can't pay our bills or we know that there's going to be a point in time where we're going to be short, we can actively do something about it before we get there. And we know exactly how much we need to, um, to pick up basically to cover that cost. And I think that that will help in the overall anxiety around cash. So uh, in overcoming shortfalls, 
I think creating new ways of making money. Uh, I know that everybody's trying to move online right now. And I know that some businesses, this is more difficult than others, but really trying to be as resourceful as possible. And I know that when we are confined and we're restricted, that we can be more creative than when we have no restrictions because it forces us to do something that maybe we wouldn't do otherwise. Um, and so I know that some businesses feel like you can't move online or you can't operate right now, um, but I encourage you to just brainstorm ways that maybe you could um, figure that out. I had a friend of mine, we were chatting about what a restaurant could do and um, you know, maybe having the delivery so of the food and then having a chef chat with that person for like five minutes or whatever it was sort of like a table visit like how can we create experiences for our customers that are um, if not the same but similar so uh, the the second thing to overcome shortfalls is cutting costs I think that's the most common one is just looking at what it is that we absolutely need and what we can sacrifice and I I know that looking at costs, sometimes we see them and we think, oh no, I couldn't possibly do anything about that one. But I think there's wiggle room in almost every cost. Everything is negotiable and you just need to be able to talk to the right person, in my opinion. Um, so cutting costs is definitely a big one. In this environment that we're in, taking advantage of benefits and subsidies is a big one. And I'm gonna go through the individual subsidies and benefits that are currently available, as well as the business ones in the next two. Yeah, I just wanted to throw in there um, also, um, Caitlin, I, I'm on your cutting costs um, uh, point, I called my bank up and asked them if they would cut the interest rate on my credit card, uh, mm -hmm. for example. And they agreed to do that. So, but it was really a proactive move that I had to take. Um, they didn't reach out and ask me um, if they could do that for me. So, <laughs> uh, just to your point, and that's actually going to save me, a, you know, they're going to half my interest rate, um, but I'm still going to make the payments. They said that I didn't have to make any of the minimum payments, but I'm still going to because that's a benefit to me to have half the interest rate and um, to still make the payments. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. The most cost cutting measures are proactive. Very few companies will uh, reach out to their clients and say, hey, we are willing to charge you less. Uh, so definitely cutting costs is a very proactive um, approach to overcoming shortfalls. That's a good point. Right. Okay, so, so now that we have an idea of mapping expenses and how we go about collecting expenses and then how we're gonna overcome any shortfalls that we have, let's talk about the benefits and subsidies and then we'll go into the spreadsheet demo and we'll just pull all of this together. So on the individual side, we have the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, the CURB, I think the consensus is it's CURB. I was calling it CERB in the beginning, but I think it's CURB, so now I'm calling it CURB. Uh, the deferral of the income tax filing to June 1st, 2020, and income tax payments are deferred to August 31st, 2020, which is great. Uh, increase to the Canada Child Benefits, suspension of student loan payments, and the opportunity to defer mortgage and other credit payments. So I'm gonna quickly go through uh, what each one of these is just so we have an overview, and then I'm happy to take questions on these as well. So if you have questions, then uh, Leslie will collect those for you. So the Canada Emergency Response Benefit is an income support for individuals who are making less than $1,000 in a four week period. It used to be that you had to have 14 consecutive days of no income, uh, and in the first period, from April, from March 15th to April 11th, and then zero income in the uh, four week periods after that. But yesterday Trudeau announced that it will now include people making up to $1,000 in a four week period. 
which I'm really excited about. I know that there were a lot of people that fell through the cracks on that. People who uh, in some cases have to keep working because they're in necessary essential roles, but they weren't making enough to cover their bills because their hours have been cut substantially. Um, in some cases, small businesses that could operate at a reduced capacity were just shutting down instead, which is, in my opinion, goes against what they were trying to accomplish with the see that they've changed it and that it's now uh, up to a thousand dollars a month. Uh, to apply is super easy. If you go to Canada.ca, they have, it's all there. Um, if you Google curb apply, the first thing that comes up is the, the place to apply. Um, so that benefit will provide $2,000 for every four week period and you have to reapply every period. I've heard that it's a very quick application process. Um, so if you qualify and you need it, then I encourage you to apply for that. The deferral of the income tax filing, I think is pretty straightforward. The same with the tax uh, income tax payments. There will be no interest accrued from April 30th to August 31st. It's just as if the payment was due August 31st. And that's for any payments that became owing after March 15th. So if you owed from last year, you still owe from last year and that payment hasn't been pushed out, but uh, as of March 15th. So I think that's really great. That's gonna help out a lot of uh, individuals. Uh, but also small business owners, because I know a lot of people are sole proprietors. Um, there's a increase to the Canada Child Benefit, which you don't need to apply for. It just automatically will be added to next month's payment. Um, the suspension of student loan repayments of interest, I think, is great for the people that are still paying loans. They are not accruing interest. It's basically like frozen, like your account's been frozen as of... Um, I think it's March 15th. So it's just frozen till September 30th, which is great. They have also provided the opportunity to defer mortgage and other credit payments. So that sounds good on the surface because you don't have to pay your mortgage for six months, but it's dangerous because the interest doesn't stop they capitalize the interest. And what that means is that it's now part of your principal, which means they can, they're gonna start charging you interest on that interest. So depending on the mortgage and the amortization period, like how long the mortgage is for, it can add an extra like 30,000 plus to the full mortgage. So if, if you need to do it, then absolutely it's a great way to increase your cash because you obviously don't have to make that payment, but on the flip side, it's not free. So that should be a last resort in my opinion. Um, those credit card payments though, or not payments, sorry, but uh, calling to get the credit card interest reduced, that kind of thing, seeing if you can get a lower interest rate. I absolutely recommend calling the bank to try and do that. And um, I know that the banks right now, they have a vested interest in individuals being okay financially through this pandemic. So a lot of them are willing to work with you and the interest rates have been lowered by the Bank of Canada. So they do have a bit of wiggle room there. Mm -hmm. So definitely call your bank, see what they can do for you. Um, do we have any questions about any of that? Don't see any questions. Not yet? Okay. If you have questions about something that I've already talked about, definitely put it in the chat box there for Leslie and I'll, we'll go back, no problem. On the business side, so most of the benefits are for individuals from the government. And my thought there is that if the government supports individuals, it's individuals who make up business. So it doesn't help you pay commercial rent and that kind of thing. Although they did announce that just today, there will be a commercial rent assistance program that they're gonna put together. The 
commercial rent, anything rent related is uh, for or is regulated by the provinces. So the federal government has announced this, but they have to coordinate with the provinces. So there's not a lot of details on that yet, um, but look forward to that. Too. Hmm. Most of the support though is for individuals because their thought or my thought of their thought is that they, if they can support individuals and the, the individual will come out on the other side in a sense, then that individual will then be able to go out and spend money and support the business who has like been frozen over the course of the pandemic. I know that there are a lot of holes in that, uh, in that, you know, a business has bills to pay and they can't necessarily just stop and their bills stop. So it's not a perfect solution, but that's why most of the subsidies and benefits are for individuals. Having said that, there are a few things that um, businesses can take advantage of. So there are two wage subsidies. Those are the big ones, in my opinion. There is a temporary 10% subsidy, uh, which allows you to reduce your remittances by 10% of your gross pay. So if you had $1,000 in gross pay out to employees, then you could deduct $100 from the, the source deductions that you remitted to the government. Oh. The second uh, wage subsidy is a 75% subsidy. This one requires the business to be able to prove that it's lost 15% of its revenue year over year in March. So comparing March 2020 to March 2019, you have to be able to prove that you have a 15% reduction in revenue. And for... Uh, April, May, and into June, I think it ends June 6th, you have to be able to prove a 30% reduction year over year. Uh, if the company didn't exist last year, then you can use January and February as your comparative periods. But if it did exist, you have to use the prior year, which in some cases is not necessarily beneficial because if your company grew, you may have increased revenue over last year, but you've still been hit by the pandemic. So we'll have to wait and see if they make any changes to that. But uh, based on the legislation, I was into the tax act the day they released it, which I don't recommend, it's a bit, a bit dense. Um, <laughs> that was what was written in the tax act was, uh, it said prescribed uh, period. So we'll, look, we'll see if they, if they make any changes to that. Um, how that works is you'll have to actually go and apply for it. So the CRA will have a portal. I'm assuming they're going to use the My Business account. Um, they haven't specified how this portal is going to work, but based on how the individual, um, like the curb, was rolled out, I assume that this will be similar. And the 75%. Uh, Caitlin, we have a question. So sure. um, circling back to get clarification on the new changes to the eligibility on the, the CERB. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, was there a specific question or should I just go over that again? Yeah, so the question is from um, M -I -M -one -one X. <laughs> Can we circle back to get clarification on the new changes in eligibility, eligibility on the CERB. So yeah, maybe just review that again, and then sure. uh, put any more um, questions that you have specifically in in the chat, and we'll address those. And thanks, Sarah. We'll yeah. get to your question after this one. So the CERB, uh, you need to have five thousand dollars in income. Uh, sorry, employment or self-employment income in 2019 or the 12 months leading up to the application. So if you had a corporation and you only took dividends, that is not employment income. Um, however, if you're a sole proprietor, that counts. If you had payroll from your corporation, that counts, no problem. They, uh, the eligibility is also based on the amount of money that you're currently making and dividends don't count for that either. So if you are pulling non-eligible dividends from your corporation, which don't uh, get hung up on the term non-eligible, small businesses, 99% um, of small businesses, it's a non-eligible dividend. So if you're pulling dividends from your company, 
they don't count towards your income or the CERB. And it's so it's employment or self-employment income of $1,000 or less, you can apply for the CERB. So that means like, so if I'm, so if someone uh, is earning $1,000 now and mm -hmm. earned over $5,000 in the last 12 months or in 2019, they're eligible. Yes. Their income needs to have been impacted by the pandemic ah. as well. Okay. So if you were making less than a thousand dollars before and you're you've maintained a consistent like working income throughout the, the whole thing, it's you're not eligible because the point is to support people impacted by the pandemic. Right. Um, and right, right. And I also heard that they're basically approving everybody now and then yes. we'll retro retroactively ask, I guess, in some way for some sort of proof. Is that right, Caitlin? Yes, that's right. So they're not asking for any sort of proof whatsoever right now. You just click a couple boxes and you say, yes, I qualify. And you get the money a couple days later. And they will absolutely be auditing this later. This is, they, it's not just going to be on the honor system, like the prime minister keeps saying, they are gonna have a lot of audit work to do later. And yeah, we'll need to be able to prove this, that you really did qualify. Right. Yeah, something to keep in mind too, is this income is taxable. So they're not taking any source deductions from, like you get the full $2,000, but that's gross. So you will have to include that $2,000 on your income taxes for, when you file your 2020 income taxes. Um, I have seen a number of things on the internet right now that I don't know if it's meant to scare people or if people are really trying to be helpful, but if you need that money, don't feel like you need to save for taxes right now. When you get to the end of this and you're back at work or you're, you're theoretically, you know, doing better because we're all able to go back to our like semi-normal lives. I'm not sure it'll be normal at the end of the year. You will theoretically be making more money. So you'll be able to cover those taxes. Your tax rate will also be a lot lower than it was in 2019 because as a whole for the year, you will have made less money. So if you can do it and save for taxes now, I'm definitely do that but don't feel bad if you can't, you will, you'll make it up later. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just as something from Sarah, she says, um, no question, but my mortgage broker said applying for a mortgage payment deferral would freeze our secured line of credit. So we should do it because we may need to dip into our line of credit during this time. Thoughts on that, Caitlin? that would be the way that it's set up with that specific bank in that specific situation mm. um, that's not the that's not come from the federal government so i can't really comment because i don't know how that all the relation like the moving pieces there are working right, right. Um, but if you've been given advice by your banker like they are an expert and they should be doing you know they should be working for you so Oh, they said actually, sorry, to, to, to clarify, I said they shouldn't do it because they may need to dip into the line of credit during this time. Oh, I see. So I see. Freeze the secured line of credit so they shouldn't do it because they need to, may need to dip into it during that time. Interesting. I see. Yeah. And again, that's, I, every bank has set this up differently. I've read a number of contracts with the, um, with a few of the other uh, like the, the emergency business account, for example, and each bank is administering it differently. So we've got guidance from the government, which is kind of an umbrella, but then each bank makes its own decisions and its own policies. So yeah, I, I mean, if, if, the, if the banker is saying, we're going to freeze your line of credit and you're afraid that you will need that later, then yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. not sure I would, I would yeah. do that either. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Mm -hmm. Um, did that, if that didn't answer the question that you have, then uh, put a, just let, let us know. 
Um, so this, the 75% subsidy needs to be applied for, and I'm hoping that it goes through the My Business account. That will make everything a lot easier. Right now, it's not open. It's going to be about three weeks or so as they set all this up. They only just passed the legislation last weekend, so it'll take a bit of time for them to get everything set up. Uh, in the meantime, what you can do is go into your business account and get your company set up for direct deposit. That will make the payments come to you a lot faster than getting a check right now. So something to do. Uh, how these subsidies work together is that if you reduce your source deductions by the 10%, then you just get like that money is then reduced from the payment you would get on your 75% subsidy. So if from the previous example, you reduce your remittances by $100, the payment for the 75% subsidy would be reduced by $100. So they work together, but you don't get both in a sense. Sorry, Caitlin, one, one quick question, uh, another question. Um, do you, have you heard of uh, situations where auto and home insurance are also helping out individuals and or businesses? So reduction in rates, terms of deferring payments? Yeah. I'm sure if you gave them a call, they would be willing to work with you. It's in the company's interest to work with you rather than just cut you off right because yeah. a lot of people are going through this and they want to keep you as a client um and if they cut you off then they're not they get nothing basically right. so i i haven't heard anything specifically but i would be willing to bet that if you called them and you talked to them they would be willing to work with you okay thank you uh the canada emergency business account this is the $40,000 interest-free loan that we've heard about. It's for businesses to be able to fund operating expenses. So it's uh, $40,000 interest-free until December 31st, 2020. And if you pay it all back before that date, 25% of it is forgivable. So that's $10,003. So you'd pay back, sorry, 30,000 because the 10,000 would be forgivable. And to qualify for that, you need to have had payroll of between 20,000 and 1.5 million in 2019. So they just changed it today. It used to be between 50,000 and a million, but today they announced that they were changing the upper and lower bounds. So it is 20,000. So I think that's gonna help a fair number of small business owners, uh, which is great because we need cash for operating expenses right now. Um, something to keep in mind there is you have to use it for operating expenses. You cannot pay off existing debts. For example, you can service existing debts. You can make payments that you would have made anyways, but you can't, um, you can't do anything new in a sense. You couldn't buy a new car. You couldn't uh, consolidate debt, that kind of thing. Uh, this is one of those ones where all of the banks have their own contracts. So make sure you read yours with your, uh, your institution. And are there any other, <laughs> such as, um, I, I think I also heard say the founders can't suddenly increase their salaries. Uh, yes. yeah, right. Yeah. So you can't do anything differently. So if you, you couldn't give your employees a raise either, um, okay. like everything, it's just to be able to maintain the company. You can't be making, um, you can't fund changes in any way. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, going back to that 75% subsidy, actually that um, only, so the 75% of the wages paid to employees, but it's the, average of what you paid those employees from January 1st to March 15th, 2020. So if you were paying them on average $1,000 a week, you could only claim $750 from that employee. If you gave them a raise after March 15th, that piece isn't covered by the subsidy and it maxes out at $843 a week per employee. Hmm. Now we have another question. Um, is it possible uh, um, for the SIBA 
to switch from being paid in dividends to salary. Now I'm assuming that you're talking about in 2019. So say um, somehow you can do that, but. Uh, uh, no, you, you needed to have a payroll account open and active with the CRA prior to March 15th. Um, and if, if you have already filed a T5, which is the dividends income um, slip, and you went back and said, no, thank you, I'd like to cancel that and change it to a T4, the government is not going to allow that because you've made a decision not based in business, but just to take advantage of this uh, SIVA. Right. They're not going to, like, it's all going to go through, like, you're going to be able to do it, but when they come back and they are, they're auditing this too, right? Like, it's all right. going to be looked at later. You're going to be in trouble for that. Good point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so the deferral of HST and GST payments and the customs and duty payments have also been deferred um, to, so anything that came due or that is owing from March 27th to May 31st is now due June 30th. So small uh, delay in, in that. Um, and deferral of income tax payments to August 31st as well. That is for corporations. Anything that came due from, uh, it should be March 15th to, it will be the same as the, um, to, sorry, the same as the individual side, deferred to August 31st. Um, do we have any questions about any of that before I jump into the demo? No, it looks like we're... <laughs> No questions yet. Great. Okay. So step three, let's tie all of this together in one tool so that we can actually get eyes on this and not try and just do it in our brains because uh, it's tough to do this in your head. So I am going to switch to Excel. Can you all see my spreadsheet here? Yep, looks good, Caitlin. Great. So I I like to do this by week, like I said, because I think that it gives a better picture and we're able to make better decisions. Um, so we'll start with April 12th because that's this week. Um, and then the 19th. And we can just drag, oops, drag this out. And let's do to the end of June, because that's when a lot of these, June 6th is when a lot of these subsidies and such end. So we'll do the end of June. Then I want to start with cash out. I want to look at expenses first. So cash out. So if you if you want to, um, I don't know if this is going to work, but if you want to like, let me know what you spend money on in the chat box, then I can add it in here, but I will add a few of the more common ones. So rent, for example, and mortgage. And these are things that are coming out of our bank accounts, not that we're spending um, on the credit card because the credit card doesn't impact our cash when we spend it or when we charge the credit card. It's the credit card payment that impacts our cash. So if you put it on your credit card, it doesn't belong in this spreadsheet. Um, so we'll do utilities and maybe we could do like a car loan. And I'm gonna put the credit card payment in here. Fancies, maybe. Um, sorry? Insurance. Yeah, insurance. Uh, probably a good start. Maybe like uh, entertainment, which is maybe like our Netflix bill or something like that. Um, groceries, that's a big one. So I, 
I would do this for your home and for your business. So I would separate the two of them because they should be very separate. Um, but we need to do them both because they're sort of this the all within the same ecosystem. Um, so maybe groceries doesn't belong in your business, on your business side, but certainly on the personal side. Okay, so I'll just leave it there for now. And then I want to total what we've got here so that we can see the amount that we're spending this week. So maybe our mortgage payment is $1,200 and we can, oh, but our mortgage payment's probably not on the 12th of April. Maybe we can get $120. Oops. Maybe we had our credit card payment is here. We have probably have our mortgage payment this week because the first of the month falls in here. Um, so just inputting all of the amounts that we spend money on, that we know we're gonna spend money on. And then, so this will be our total cash out. And then we want to do, oh, cash in. So maybe this is our, maybe it's curb because we've applied for curb and we got $2,000. Uh, maybe we have business income as well, but we paid ourselves out of the company and maybe that's 550 this week because now we know that curb allows us to make a little bit of money. We're like, okay, great. We're going to pay ourselves a bit of money and we'll take a total of this. So now we know how much money is coming in this, this week. And we can look at the cash increase, decrease. I always like to put the decrease in brackets so that I know if I'm looking at a negative number that my money's gone down and I don't have to think about it. So I can say equals my cash in minus my cash out. And at the top here, what I forgot to put in is the bank account balance. So oops. we want to start here with our current bank balance. So maybe my bank account is $234 in it right now. Then when we get down here, we can have a bank balance at the end of the week as well. So that we're tracking each week plus my increase or decrease. Great. So now if I were to drag these out, it would want this to equal my ending balance down here. It will tell us where uh, our shortfalls are going to be. Whoops. Come on now. So I'm good for this week. But because I have to make a credit card payment this next week, I'm going to be in trouble. So I know that I have to figure out how to make $230 at least by whatever day this credit card payment is due by April 19th. Um, and I think that this, in doing this exercise and using your bank statements to know when you pay things and how much it is and uh, what you spend money on will really help to illustrate where the issues are going to be. Um, so maybe, and then, you know, if I, if I cannot make any additional money in here, then what can I do about this credit card payment or what can I do about my mortgage payment or, you know, can I talk to my car loan um, company and defer loan payments if necessary? Um, if I had entertainment expenses in here, you know, like Netflix probably goes on the credit card um, here. Well, it definitely goes on the credit card. Um, but what can I do to get that credit card payment down? What expenses can I cut? And have a look at your credit card statement and go through it 
Like, what do I really need to be spending money on? Maybe you can share a Netflix account. I know Netflix is okay with that now. I think you kind of have to pay a little bit more, but you shared it between three people. If you live in a, an apartment, can you share internet with your neighbor? Um, are you able to, maybe you're a two car household. Can you t uh, take the driving insurance off of one of the cars? Like, how do you go through and reduce your expenses as much as possible? And how do you do it before you know that you're going to be in trouble here? Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense, Caitlin. So it's really sort of a predictive way. Oh, we have a question. Um, what if you pay some bills on your credit card for the points? Would I categorize that in credit card payments? Do you mean if you pay for some bills on your credit card with points? Um, or the utilities? So if you pay some bills with your credit card, um, would you categorize that in credit card payment? Huh. Yes, so this is only what impacts your bank account. But your so cash you don't, flow. Yes, because if, if you don't pay it out of your bank account and you put it in here, it's going to be double counted because it'll be within the credit card payment because that's cash you put on your credit card and you've put in the amount that you've charged to your credit card. So you've, you've picked that up twice. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it might be worthwhile to turn your statement, your credit card statement into a spreadsheet if you're comfortable with Excel and just having a look through it or just looking at your credit card um, or sorry, yeah, turning your statement into a spreadsheet so that you can do the same exercise, but with a credit card so that you can project how, when your credit card charges are gonna be. Um, and that would help you to make up this credit card payment number. Right. So it would look exactly like this, but it would be all the things that you put on your credit card. Right. Right. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. So the answer to that is no. So this is really an exercise in this sort of emergency period of keeping as much cash on hand so that we can keep the cash flow going. Yes. Um, yeah. And predicting when that there might be a shortage in cash flow. So I like the control aspect here. You know, you, you, it feels like we're more in control um, of our lives. I think that's helpful right now yeah. too, when everything's feels a little out of control. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, some of the some of the the tricks in maximizing cash flow are things like you don't make a payment until the last day it's due. So if if your credit card is due on April 30th, don't pay it now, pay it on April 30th, because then you can use that cash for what you need it for. You still have to be sure that, you, you know, you're going to be able to pay that bill. But if you know you're going to get money later, don't give, don't make a payment early. Um, the, and then the flip side of that is how can you get people to pay you faster? Mm -hmm. How do you uh, you know, tighten your accounts receivable terms. Maybe you used to give 60 days. Maybe it's 45 days now. Maybe it's 30 days. Maybe you can offer a small incentive for getting paid within 10 days or, you know, anything that you can do to get paid faster. So money in faster, money out slower <laughs> is the basic uh, rule there. All of that needs to be through the lens of maintaining relationships though. If you suddenly go to your customers and say, by the way, everything's due on receipt now. I know you used to have two months, but now it's due today. That's probably going to, you know, people aren't going to be very happy with you about that. Uh, and the same on the vendor side, you know, if you normally pay your vendors within a couple of weeks of them sending an invoice and then you suddenly are waiting till the very last minute. Um, while it's technically allowed, I would maybe just have a conversation with them before you make any drastic changes to that. But um, that is the general sort of, money in faster, money out slower, so that you can use your cash instead of giving it to other people. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense, Katie. Okay, thank you. So, back here. so that was the spreadsheet. We, I have created this spreadsheet and it's much, um, 
I took more time to do it, and uh, I'm that will be going out to uh, that'll that'll be in an email later, as I understand. And so in that spreadsheet, I've created both home and business tabs for you, so you can do um, both of them. And um, yeah, it's although they're two separate tabs, and I believe that they should be separate. Make sure to to understand that your everything works within the ecosystem. So um, you know if you're short on one side. You can, and you're you've got more on one side than the other. Then, definitely trying to figure out how to make it work as a whole, even though it's separate. And that's that's it. This is uh, how you can connect with me. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Caitlin, and we'll make sure that everybody has that uh, your contact details in our follow up email with everyone. So. Perfect. Okay, let me just wrap this up. So wanted to thank all of you really um, just so happy that you were here today for our first webinar of our weekly series. Um, as I mentioned before, we'll be broadcasting regularly at uh, on Tuesdays at 1pm. So if you sign up for our, um, our webinar series, you can just drop in on the one that interests you the most. And as mentioned as well, we are putting together a video of this webinar um, and it will be available for the Alpha Woman Co community. So uh, we'll be sending this out to all of you with a link to the presentation and of course, Caitlin's cash flow spreadsheet. Um, please give us your feedback on this webinar. We would love it. Um, also, any suggestions for any future webinars would be really appreciated. You can email me directly at leslie at alphawomanco.com or leave your feedback on any of our social platforms, Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and Twitter at Alpha Woman Co. But most of all, dear friends, please stay safe and healthy during this time. Thanks again for joining in.